You are listening to Cemetery Confessions, the world's number one goth talk podcast. All right, hello, and welcome back to Cemetery Confessions. This month, we're going to be looking at aging and goth culture and how we queer accepted social constructs of age as uh, we continue to participate in goth culture through major life changes. Uh, We're going to be chatting with Leah, a doctoral student at the University of Maryland, who recently wrote her thesis on that exact subject uh, as a case study for the goths in the Baltimore scene. Um, She's also working on some other research we may get into, but just so you know, Leah is the guitarist in the post-punk band Skydivers, which I had a chance to check out, and they are really, really good. I recommend you guys check them out. Uh, She's also the host of Delightfully Depressing, a goth music radio show, which you can find on WMUC FM College Park, as well as streaming online. And of course, I'll have links to all that cool stuff in the show notes. So as always, I am the Count and I am here with my stand-in co-host Trey. Welcome back, Trey. Thank you. It's good to be back as always. And Leah, thank you for coming on. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me on and hey from the outskirts of Baltimore. As as far as I'm aware, you don't actually label yourself as a goth, though you obviously have uh, a lot of interests within the culture, uh, see aforementioned band. So I'm interested to hear I guess, first of all, what your history is with the kind of introduction to goth or alternative culture, and as an adult now, how you kind of view the label as it applies to you and your identity. Hmm. That's that's interesting. I was a teenager in the late 90s, so goth at that time was unfairly labeled as, you know, Columbine having to do with violence and things like that. And um, the music that I was exposed to that, you know, like Marilyn Manson, I knew that wasn't goth, but, you know, this was before Spotify. This was, you know, a lot harder to have access to, you know, music that would be considered like, you know, goth classics today. So um, I think the music is really is really what got me into it. And I didn't find that until I was probably in my mid twenties. Um, I remember finding the Cure's CD greatest hits in a bargain bin, you know, thinking, Oh, that looks cool. And you know, it's the kind of thing that you put in your car CD player and it changes your life. <laughs> Cause I had played guitar for, um, it's been about over 20 years now, but I was more into, you know, alternative rock and things like that. And, um, after, you know, I heard The Cure, it came to, you know, I found Joy Division, I found Juju by Susie and the Banshees. I was just floored. I just thought, this is just incredible, and how did I never hear about this before? Mm-hmm. So um, how the thesis wound up happening was I joined Skydivers. Um, it was probably around 2010. It's hard to believe. Oh, wow. And... Um, my first New Year's in the band, uh, we were invited to play a private party for some friends of the singer. So I thought, okay, sure, you know, why not? And I get there and the house is, I don't, I don't want to call it, everybody there looks kind of goth and they're, you know, in their forties. I I can't call it a goth house, but you know, I, I get there and I think this is just so cool. And we go back, you know, for a couple of different New Year's it's, you know, and, um, husband and wife, in the house at the time, and um, it was the wife's 40th birthday party. I think it was the second or third year we played it, and um, they had a funeral for her birthday. And so her friends lovingly carried in this handmade casket, and they had a funeral to her youth with a framed picture and roses, <laughs> and and she got in the casket, and they were all laughing, and... I I was just thinking, this is just so awesome. So, you know, what leads people to, to keep doing things like, like goth, you know, it's what draws people to something, but what keeps them doing Mm. it. So that's kind of where the, the project got started from. 
So have you run in kind of the same circles with goths uh, most of your life or that would just started with the band? Well, we're not a goth band. Um, right. I'm just kind of a loner. <laughs> you know, I've worn black and band t-shirts for 20 years. So mm -hmm. I've never, I think part of it too was that we didn't really have a goth like scene in my high school. Okay. There were like yeah. rumors of goth clubs downtown, but you know, without a car, how am I going to get there? So, yeah. and it was interesting later on to get to visit these places. So you're Andrew Eldridge, basically, <laughs> is what you're telling me. Not a goth band. We just, goths love us, and I I don't know why. Well, let's jump into your, your thesis then and start talking about the, I don't know, let's talk, let's start at the beginning. We we talked briefly about, you know, off air about um, a specific paper by uh, Van Elfren. Mm -hmm. But when you started looking into the existing sociological research for your thesis, um, how did you kind of take some of that? Were there some, I don't know, methodological issues you had with them? Were you, did you find a meaningful revelation? Um, how did you feel about what kind of existed out there? Because that is something that I've had discussions with goths as far as not published academic papers, but the books that those academics have published and the ideas they've put forth. What were some of those that were interesting or you took issue with, I guess? Well, I think there are two, almost two schools of thought in looking at goth and the gothic. Um, mm -hmm. There's the sociologists who were coming in and looking at, you know, the, the functions of the goth, looking at the semiotics of goth. And then you have uh, scholars coming in on the literature and history side, talking about the monstrous, the uncanny. So these concepts that are drawn from historical literature and yeah. trying to put them together. So I started off my bachelor's degrees in sociology. So I started off looking at the sociological literature um, around the time that I was considering going going back to grad school. I actually went the next year. I was on vacation in Salem, Massachusetts, which says a lot okay. about me right there. <laughs> but I remember finding uh, this big academic book called Goth. And I, yeah. I, I just, I was like, this, I, this is mine. This is mine. So, you know, I, I, I took it home and I looked at it. And as I got into graduate school, I was able to, to deconstruct that book a little bit better and see that kind of what it, what it was doing. It was published, I think, in 2006, which means that a lot of the research and writing would have been done in the late 90s to early 2000s. Yeah. And it was kind of a humanities-based case for looking at the different meanings of the Gothic image. But what people weren't looking at is, what does this mean to individual people? What are their lives like? What stories can they share with us? And what can we learn from them? So that's kind of, you know, goth in, in everyday life was kind of the, the starting point for for thinking about yeah. my master's thesis. I remember, I remember reading that book for the first time when, uh, when my son was born. We were in the hospital for about 10 days because he was a preemie. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was my first academic read of goth. And um, I understood like 25 percent of it <laughs> i kept i kept rereading sentences like what does this even mean and now i can you know yeah it's not an, an issue but uh i have very vivid memories of trying to understand what these people were talking about uh, yeah. at the time i understand but it I, now i'm sorry i don't mean to cut you off I, I i understand it now as being exceptionally well crafted um mm. especially the introduction but you need to speak a certain language to be able yeah. to understand that and you know not everybody speaks that language and that wasn't the language i wanted to write in that's something trey criticizes me of often enough about the way <laughs> the way i speak on the podcast and in uh in facebook comments yeah it's just a matter of being able to speak to your audience versus speaking to a arbitrary outsider audience that you to some degree idolize yeah um, and the audience on your Facebook and oftentimes on the podcast is not the audience of a, an academic conference. Mm -hmm. And when you speak in the language of an academic conference while simultaneously trying to reach and inform those that are members of the local community or the worldwide Gothic community that subscribe to Cemetery Confessions mm -hmm. or 
are on the webpage, I think is it's doing a disservice to the research in that you're making it unapproachable for those who don't speak that language and giving them maybe an excuse to, to write it off. Though you could also have the side benefit of getting them interested in learning it. So it could go both ways, but I think approachability is a good idea. Yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I yeah, I go both ways. I went to the extreme a couple of years ago where I was just incomprehensibly uh, obtuse with my <laughs> academic jargon. So I try to find a uh, balance now. But anyway, getting back to the one of the one of the interesting things about your thesis when you were talking about the literature, sociological r- literature surrounding goth was the tendency to. I don't know, romanticize or venerate goth culture to a degree. And I think the the global gothic paper from Van Elfren was a good, I mean, that's the most recent one I've read, was a good um, example of that because she, from what I remember, a large, the driving force behind that paper was to position goth culture as unlocated and Mm -hmm. thus unique. So she talks about how, um, because of the internet, goth is uh, ge- geographically unlocated and culturally unlocated because of the propensity to uh, reflect on times past and build this romanticized, unrealistic version of reality. And as I was reading through the paper, it was interesting to hear her thoughts. But I was, I was like, "This is you're literally describing every." cultural group of people who are on the internet and have some notion of what what their history is like any any ethnic group any uh political group anything it's there's a a discourse between current behavioral norms and um the past which is almost always idealized to some degree and then you know everyone is online now so those identities also interact with online identities so i did see that in some of the literature of trying to position goth as this uniquely i don't know this special group of people who don't have any kind of cultural comparison and i i felt like that did does a disservice to the common bonds we have as people Mm -hmm. as as just people living in a culture i guess it does, but I think it also is is a divergence of the common conception of what a subculture is, in that it does have this, you know, hierarchical, it's beneath, it's subsumed by whatever that culture that it is sub, and that is oftentimes viewed as a, uh, as a localized culture, as, as something to do with a nation state or a region, mm-hmm. and having something that is seemingly regionless or that has a cohesive concept of itself outside of those national borders when you've got people in the UK and in the US and in China and in Brazil who can all sort of come together with this somewhat cohesive, though there are decided differences culturally um, if you look at them, but there is enough cohesiveness that you can all look at that and say, okay, these are all members of, say, the Gothic subculture or goth subculture and that is, to some degree, a diversion or a divergence from what the preconception of subculture versus culture might incline one to believe. Well, yeah, I mean, Leo, you kind of touch on that in your thesis, actually, about the Paul Hodkinson's uh, consistent distinctiveness versus uh, what's his face's ideology driven culture. Yeah, I don't know. I think we're kind of. I, I guess that gets into the whole, into the whole globalization thing, mm-hmm. which has nothing to do with your <laughs> your thesis at all. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, uh, my work is basically uh, it's situated at the juncture of a couple of different fields, and um, the P- I got my master's in American studies at the University of Maryland. That's what this thesis was for, and uh, continued on into the PhD program there. So this is a project that I've been working on for a few years. So because of you know. It's an American studies project. One thing that it really, that I really tried to do was also fill in a gap thinking about, you know, Paul Hodkinson is, you know, the goth guy, you know, the goth yeah. subculture guy. Yeah. And um, he actually was the DJ at one of the International Gothic Association conferences. Oh, wow. I know. I went to That's the amazing. one in Vancouver, but he wasn't there. And the International Gothic Association conference mostly was history and literature. 
there were maybe okay. two goths and they talked about music, which is another topic. But um, I haven't I haven't heard much out of him recently. He, I guess he describes himself as a recovering goth <laughs> now. But yeah, yes. he's he's looking at at England and yeah. So, you know, looking at American literature on the goth subculture, you basically have that goth anthology and that's kind of it. So mm. people weren't really looking at. There is that. There's that one terrible book. I can't remember what it was called. I have it down. All my all my books are downstairs right now. But there was one specifically about American culture, but it ended up situating goth as a sexuality BDSM based culture, and I can't remember what the hell it was called. But it was absolutely ridiculous. Uh, was that so? Was that Goth Dark Empire? Yes, okay. that's it. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That book is that's bananas. just using a different set of scholarly tools. <laughs> yeah, but that's why I like um, interdisciplinary work because you, if you, if you have a, only one specific framework, you end up kind of doing that top down, trying to make the data fit for the framework rather than seeing what the, like you were saying, the practical lived experience of the the people is right yeah and so my yeah interpreting it that way my thesis wound up having two different thrusts because i didn't know at the time if i was going to be uh going into a phd program so i thought well this is a good chance i'm just going to say it all so (laughs) i wound up uh, dividing it into two parts one is the kind of goth in everyday life and i interviewed um three members of the goth community here at length and they, who've had some sort of involvement in the scene for many years, one is a DJ, another owned a clothing shop at the time, and the third um, is an Anglican priest who's also a goth musician. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I wanted to learn, I wanted to learn about their lives, see kind of what they had to balance. And then I started to go out to some of the local goth nights. And I noticed, at least at the time, most of the night there was nobody dancing. People were sitting there and talking. And the dance floor is empty. You know, the, the DJ is talking with people at the bar. So thinking, okay, there's something different going on here. So I kind of had half of the thesis being individual lives and a chapter about Portlandia, which is... <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, and, and then the other half is about, you know, identities inside the club. So, let well, maybe we can... St- start a little bit before we get to that stuff there was this uh, one portion where you talk about um how aging is more of a social construct construct and you kind of apply queer theorizing to um how goths i guess interpret the signs of aging and kind of turn it on its head right is, is, can, I mean, can you talk about that a little bit, sort of how what queer theory is and how that applies to what you were looking at? Okay, sure. I'll actually start, if it's all right with you, with talking a little bit about what aging as a social construct yeah, means, yeah. if that would be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so if you've ever heard things like, you know, gender as a social construct, things like mm-hmm. that, that means that when applied to age, that means things like age and aging are something that emerge from a framework of power relations, which mark youth as being desirable and old age as being undesirable. Mm -hmm. So despite having greater wisdom and more knowledge of the world, people who are older are viewed as less valuable. Mm -hmm. And Pierre Bordeaux talked about that. He called it social aging. And Bordeaux was a sociologist. He was writing in 84. And he was talking about Mm. making do with what we have, even if it means we deceive ourselves. He was talking more about our economic status as workers. But And then Mm. um, another author, um, Margaret Morgan roth Gallette, talked about this as being aged by culture. So culture is something that also puts more value on youth instead of you know, middle age, older age, and the things that we learn. So I was, and ageism is something that makes me really angry these days because I'm starting to see yeah. it everywhere. I'm, and that yeah. seems to be, not to interrupt, but it, and I mean, I don't, I don't know if you have thoughts on this, but it seems to me that that's more of a Western yes, culture. Yes, absolutely. Thing. Okay. Because I've heard that like Japanese culture has uh, ancestor worship and, and those types of things. Um, which again, I don't want to get into the global gothic thing <laughs> and how goth is cha- changes from. So yeah, but that's in, so then how how um when you were doing your paper 
your your thesis does the how does queering fit into that and then how to how does that apply to uh goth interpretation of of aging sure i think when i was writing it you know one of the the questions i was asking myself is you know what is goth the goth subculture you know what is it what not what what is but what might it show us about some alternatives to you know being mm. aged by culture to this ageism and so i started thinking about queer theory and queering and um queer theory is a paradigm which developed in the mid 90s which talked about reconceptualizing sexuality so queering can be utilized as a method where things like gender and sexuality can be deconstructed and questioned so some of my thinking and i realized that the way i use this might be contentious because I'm not specifically referencing sexuality as I discuss goth. I think that can be mm. an aspect of it, but it's not what I focused on. But for some scholars like Jack Halberstam, the queer is something that's defined against the normal. So it's mm. deconstructing power structures. Right. Okay. So there's also, so then, there's yeah. also a fair amount of, of queering that interrelates with feminism mm -hmm. too, which is not as sexuality based as it is with the LGBT aspect of it, um, but more about just the perceptions of gender and sexism and how that all goes in. So it's not certainly without precedent that it's been separated from sexuality itself. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's just something that we have to acknowledge how we use it. Um, so yeah. when I think about, you know, what does, you know, how do these, you know, individual actors, how do these goths queer aging? Um, Jack Halberstam talks about uh, something called queer times and temporalities. And that's mm -hmm. um, different life ways that are emerging um, from outside of non-normative structures. So talking about uh LG LGBT people and people in subcultures who, for example, don't have children and they're able to, you know, reshape their lives that way to live outside of the dominant paradigm of heterosexuality. So I, I just started thinking, you know, when I talked to the different goths, when I when I viewed how they, you know, how they lived, with how they worked, how they danced, you know, I, I thought about, well, these are gothic temporalities. These are... Mm -hmm you know, individualized lifestyle projects that people put together mm -hmm. to allow them to live the way they want to in a way that um, works, you know, with gothic tastes and values. Yeah. Yeah, I do find the... Um, especially... So for myself as a parent, mm -hmm. um, I definitely am in the minority and I find, like, I just read this article this morning, or I skimmed it at least, about the, in Wicca and paganism, there's the the feminine deity is the maiden, mother, and crone. And the article was about how that is a terrible representation of what's supposed to be the feminine divine because it's based in reproductive cycles. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, again, goes back to that kind of aging as a biological outcome mm -hmm. that's sort of uh, imposed by social delimitations and um i i don't know when when you were when you were doing your interviews when you were talking to these goths how did you find that they were queering or um creating these other these alternate aging temporalities that sort of broke down those walls of aging is based in your reproduction or your uh socially constructed um phases how, how are they changing that for themselves well i, I don't think goths and, and children are, are mutually exclusive <laughs> it just right. makes it a little harder to go out to dance nights when you need a babysitter mm. um <laughs> i think it's how i wound up writing it is three case studies so i think that it's different for every person but each person that I spoke with had made some significant life decisions that allowed them to participate in the subculture. For example, the woman who's a DJ is single by choice, mm -hmm. and her day job doesn't matter to her. 
Um, she wants to be a DJ. That's what matters. And, you know, those are, those are significant choices or, um, the woman who owned a clothing shop, she and her husband are both self-employed and, you know, it means, as she said, you know, it means not having a lot, but they're able to go do the things that they love. And for her, that's, that's, you know, going out clubbing and the, the, uh, the Anglican priest, he, and that this is an, an interesting story. I, I was curious. So, um, I went to one of his church services and, um, as I was walking down the aisle from, from taking the Eucharist, I heard these familiar chords, you know, the organist is playing these familiar chords. So I start going through the hymnal and trying to find out which hymn had the chords for Mad World by Tears for Fears. <laughs> so after the church service, you know, I just had to ask. And he said, oh, no, he was playing Mad World. So, um, you know, he found a church that is accepting of, you know, his, his uniqueness. I, I was thinking, you know, how does, how does something like goth and religion intertwine? You know, I don't think, you know, darkness or whatever has to be anti-religious, but I was just curious. So, and he said from the pulpit, people might ask, how does an old punk and goth guy like me, like Jesus? And he said, because Jesus was the most countercultural figure who ever lived. And I thought, okay, well, for him, that's how. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so for, for each person, it's, it's something that's different. It's not one monolithic, this is what goth is. Yeah. So, oh man, there's so much I want to say. <laughs> I Trey, what do, what, do you, how do you, what are your thoughts on that before I... Well, going back to, I guess, to the, the aging side of things, one of my main contentions, I don't know if it's a contention, but a question that was constantly being risen is how are you, I guess, distinguishing between those in the goth community who are perhaps mm. queering the idea of aging versus those who are just choosing to remain oblivious to it or basically hiding from the concept of aging. Because there's a lot of aspects of the gothic um, aesthetic, at least, that actively hide signs of age and infirmity, be it the heavy makeup that hides wrinkles and keeps that nice, smooth, youthful skin, be it the dyeing of hair or wearing of wigs that hides gray hairs or hides it the thinning of hair that are signs of aging, be it corsetry and other tight clothing that keep the body parts that tend to sag with age nice and close to the body and continue that youthful appearance. And how does the fact that there are so many fundamental aesthetic items as part of the Gothic look that seem to obscure age and try to project this idea of eternal youthfulness, and how is that truly queering ageism? I think because this is a site-specific study, I can only speak to what I saw. But, you know, aging, it's something that people don't like to talk about. It's hard for people to think about and, and deal with. Almost all the goths that I've come in interaction with here in Baltimore, they've all been in their 30s, 40s, and above. And it really seems, at least for the people I talk to, to be much more about a community of people that have helped things endure. There's a lot of aspects to the goth culture that seem to be about hiding from the concept of age mm -hmm. or an, an agelessness, hence the, the, the symbol of the vampire, which mm -hmm. is centuries old but still looks like they're in their 20s or teens or whenever they were, whatever age they were. And that's kind of a an aesthetic ideal and there's an aspect of that aesthetic that allows someone in, in, in goth to not confront their age and not confront those right. objects where they're not really queering it. They're not doing stuff outside of the expectations of their age and acknowledging that, yes, I am old and yet I'm still doing these youthful things. There's this idea or this, this perception that they're trying to look like they're the age that fits into these behaviors that they're persisting in even while they age. I don't know if I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, Leo, you, I guess you can respond to that. I, I think it, it's important to mention that your thesis specifically focused on the a very specific scene. So it wasn't necessarily meant to extrapolate to goth culture mm -hmm. as a entity. That's correct. It was very much looking at not only Baltimore, but a certain 
subset of um, of adults in in Baltimore. I wrote the thesis in I uh, finished it in spring 2016, so it's already two years old. And um, I've noticed that there have been some younger people coming in. And the older goths have also, Baltimore has a few goth clubs, but they've gravitated towards one certain club and away from the longest running goth club, which is now populated by youth. Who some people are saying they're not, it's not really goth there anymore, but that was also a few years ago, so. Yeah, I don't. And I mean, Trey, you can obviously you can speak to your own experience. I don't know if I have seen the vampiric immortality sort of ideal really lived out as far as the when it comes to the goths I've talked to on the podcast or interacted with. I don't know as like a comparison, I suppose, would be pop music where it's all about the young the the young look and you have Madonna or someone like that who is always con you know it's about looking as young as possible or as ageless as possible. I honestly don't think I see that within goth culture. I of course there's some of that. Um, as with anything, there's some interpolation of external behaviors into any culture, which gets into the you know the personal personal ontologies and identities are always going to be multifaceted. And I think goth itself is a homology, like a multifaceted um, agreed upon set of flexible principles or axioms or pillars or however you want to structure that. But I, it does seem to me there's less, again, as someone with as someone who's a parent, when I interact with goths older or younger uh, there, it seems like the, uh, non-marriage, non-parenting uh, um, ideology is more prevalent within goth culture than the, uh, you know, heteronormative, get married, get a house, have a kid kind of thing. And so I don't necessarily think that I've seen older goths feel a pressure to conform, at least the ones I've talked to, conform to a youth standard or feel they need to do that in order to fit in because it also seems like most younger goths are interested in uh learning from older goths and hearing their stories that's why the whole term elder goth is a thing because it's a position of uh respect i guess that something you gain when, when if we're talking about um social uh, social uh, uh capital Largely with goth, the, the specialized knowledge and um, dedication is to a degree gained through time in the culture. So I don't know that I see an expectation of older goths to look younger. It's not so much the expectation that they're being forced, but there's just the, the, that aspect of the aesthetic that just by its very nature hides signs of aging it doesn't celebrate any, you know, any sense of agedness. It's not like, you know, mm -hmm. someone with the, the, the white hair is more respected because that's a sign of aging. That's a sign of nobility of age. Um, there's just, there's a lot of those aesthetics that, that just seem to hide overt signs of aging. Maybe not consciously, maybe yeah, not on purpose. Yeah, th that's the thing. But I, I don't think it's, that's the driving, I, I, I don't think the aesthetic is built on a notion of ageless or timelessness I, I, oh, oh for my. the sake of being young, maybe timelessness for the sake of being a, a thing out of time or a thing constructed through uh, historical ephemera. Mm -hmm. My, my but, contention isn't that it's a, a conscious effort to hide your age. It's just the fact that the aesthetic choices that are central to goth happen to also very readily and very strongly conceal all the standard signs of being aged. And it's possible too. one of the, uh, my informants, the DJ, she said, you know, she described Baltimore as blue collar goth, where appearance is not something that is hugely important. Mm. And she compared that to DC, which she said is more corporate goth and buttoned up. And I've, I've heard that from people. I originally was going to do a comparison of uh, Baltimore and DC, but one of my professors said, no, you're never going to get this done. Pick one city. 
That's, you know what, <laughs> I, I somebody actually emailed me and said they were working on their undergrad paper. They wanted to focus on the differences between like how local culture has an impact on um, pr- I, uh, ideals and norms for goth and how that changes from place to place. And I was like, I, I have some thoughts on it, but like, good luck getting that written. That's that seems like an impossible undertaking. Right. Yeah. They're like, you don't need to do it all. Yeah. And um, so I, I, I guess like and my, Trey, you know, you know, you've seen my homology hypothesis. I think the, the difference here is that it's not uh, like, I guess, from my perspective, if we're talking about what goth is and what it venerates and how it's uh, ontologically enacted that there's, there's certain um, structural expectations, but depending on where you live as you know, going back to the blue collar goth as various aspects of those will be more or less important, but overall those are generally all still there. It's just depending on what you want to play, whether it's music or whether it is aesthetic or whether it's, um, uh, philosophical departure like uh from from perceived like ma- uh, you know mainstream ideologies or whether that's uh a sort of ritualistic enacting of atmosphere depending on who you know from individual to individual and scene to scene those whichever one of those will be most important will have an impact on how that's lived out so it makes sense to me and that's one of the problems i have i think trey an episode you were on we covered i can't remember what we were covering but one of the one of the academic papers was a ethnographic study of goths in iceland and they their conclusions from that paper extrapolated their findings to goth as an entity i i think there is going to be some variance but still an underlying uh consistent distinctiveness i go i guess to go back to that but it doesn't necessarily rely on aesthetic or music or whatever at a certain point too i stopped thinking about goth in baltimore being a subculture or a scene and i started thinking of it as being a community and i Mm. think that's when the paper started or the thesis started to shift a little bit Mm. um because it was really you know i i had no idea when i started talking to people that the three people who would be my main informants had all been friends for like 20 or 30 years. Yeah. And that we had, um, two of us had gone to the same high school. So (laughs) I had no idea either. So it was, it it was just, you know, it it became more about what is this community like than, you know, necessarily what can I Mm. extrapolate about, say their style to the entirety and, of goth culture does that make sense yeah to you? yeah and i think that's part and I, this kind of goes in with what you were saying trey but the, i think that's part of the beauty of goth is that it's not necessarily ideologically or politically or morality driven so when you were talking about um i don't want to say his name the priest uh, he he mentioned how to him Jesus was the most countercultural figure, and that's how that fit into his identity as a mm-hmm. goth. I think that goth as a construct allows for that ambiguity and diversity, so that you can rectify um, mutually exclusive worldviews with being a goth, which I think is just part of ontology in general, but as as goth culture goes because some some groups don't allow for that you must conform to specific and goth does that as well but not through the kind of what people generally tend to think of as foundational moral or religious or political uh ideologies i think it lets you be who you want to be like the um the informants talked about feeling like they belonged for the first time and they might not have specifically Mm -hmm. said goth it might have been you know freaks or weirdos right but there's this sense i i talked about non-normativity a lot Mm -hmm. in Mm -hmm. the thesis being something that is even if not necessarily directly rubbing against normativity just something that's different right like i found this me you know i heard that cure record and it was like oh my gosh you know 
it wasn't people for me. It was the music with the people I talked to in Baltimore. It's the music. It's the music. And it's, you know, goth is a community and a space to socialize with your friends. And there are some goths with, with grandkids here. And they're musicians and DJs, too. That's, a, that's pretty neat. Yeah. I think that's awesome. So it lets people be who it, they and want it's to be. We- it's weird because I was thinking about this when I was talking with Tara in her interview and she has a kid and how I still, I have this kind of uh, cognitive dissonance between the social capital that comes with saying I have achieved a life goal by having a condo and have it, raising a child and I am also still alternative and then trying to figure out how that fits within the non-normativity of goth uh because that's still a very normative, I guess, ide- like social uh, ideal. Um, and I guess for me, it all just comes back to the, the how reality is ontologically constructed and there isn't a, you know, m- the mainstream is an abstraction, not a reality. And it is just kind of this, uh, we are living out our reality through interaction with the each other and the environment. And there isn't, um, I don't know. I'm trying to, I, I, it, it just seems like this weird cognitive dissonance for me. Yeah. I, I, saying well, like, Oh yeah, I'm a parent and I'm goth. Doesn't that make me special? I, I have some theorists for you, <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, yeah, that was one thing that, that I was thinking about and maybe it's an unanswerable question. But, you know, how do people negotiate between these conflicting things, these different things, being yeah. a parent, whatever? And there's a, uh, it's not really a theory, but it's a concept by the sociologist Avery Gordon. And she's an unusual sociologist in that she's not writing about social structures. Um, and she talks about complex personhood. And that's mm. that basically life is rich and full of contradictory meanings. And sometimes it just yeah. is. Which seems like it's self-evident, but it's it it doesn't. People don't agree with that. I don't know, Trey. What do you think? What any comments on any of that? <laughs> yes, actually, I have a few. So, okay, I ahead. mean, a lot of that, as far as the the normativity and that conflict and and whatever sort of cognitive dissonance dissonance that's coming into your mind, really comes down to the 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 underlying why of that divergence from normativity. So, you know, there's this mm-hmm. idea, you know, it kind of comes down to, you know, the denigrated hipster brand. So where mm-hmm. someone is being non-normative for the sake of being non-normative, they are looking right, at right. what normal is and consciously doing the opposite of that. And that's how they're performing non-normativity. And I think they're identified you, in uh, opposition to some other thing. Correct. Yeah. And, that, and that's I think different there's, from those of us who got picked on as kids, you know? Right. But I think there's a subtext of, of some of that still lingering when you feel awkward about having these normal aspects to your life, being a parent, owning a home, but also being part of this subculture that's quote unquote non-normative. Those things aren't in conflict other than the idea that you're doing something normal while participating in a non-normative subculture and somehow that is wrong to do anything normative when you're Mm -hmm. in a non-normative subculture. And I think that's only true if the foundation of your non-normativity is as a reaction Mm -hmm. to the normative. If you're not concerned about it being a reaction, then there's no dissonance with, okay, so I did some normal things. So what? I'm doing me and I'm normative in these ways. I'm non-normative in these ways. I identify with goth or with whatever non-normative subculture the individual identifies with, but in those aspects of life that aren't core to being a member of that subculture, um, and as far as I know, there's nothing in goth that's anti-children or homeownership, um, so there's no real true conflict there other than the concept of happening to conform to some portion of normativity. And like the the whole, um, I mean, something seemed to have seriously diminished. Like um, the the shock value. One of my informants talked about, you know, putting on all kinds of crazy makeup and scaring people at the mall when mm. 
when they were younger. Yeah, and that's, that's always the, been a frustration of mine with that, that <laughs> habit, particularly amongst younger, even when I was just yeah, starting to get into yeah. goth, the idea of scaring the normies or scaring the straights was always something antithetical to my yeah. conception of how one should interact in the world. Yeah, and I'd, what, I think that's part of adolescence, though. Yeah, yeah, and oh, it's yeah, not like absolutely. You know, if you can't get a ride to the goth club, what else is there to do in the <laughs> suburbs? You know, <laughs> go to the mall. You know, it's like you, you knew somebody was cool if they had clove cigarettes because somebody had a way to get to Pennsylvania because they weren't legal here in Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> Troublemakers. Um, but obviously, that that need to, seems to have the attend the need for attention seeking behavior seems to have diminished. Yeah. And I, I'm trying to think of if anything in particular, because I did these interviews a number of years ago now, you know, their lives aren't perfect. Nobody's life's perfect. But they seem to be content with the choices that they've made. Hmm. And I think that's something, you know, I didn't get the sense that anyone is, you know, running the rat race or buying into some dream that they don't find fulfilling. Mm. And I don't know if that necessarily has to do with goth. I think it, no, it, it, you know, they've made choices that some people, you know, they're balancing middle-class life ways, as we would say in my department with, you know, membership in something that I would not say is necessarily considered deviant now. Um, mm. But you know there are, there are different places to to socialize. You know people are people are going out to a nightclub. They could have friends over for dinner, but you know they go out to the club. There, there's something that's that's different about that, and they're not going to the club to get drunk. You know, well, at least around here, not, are, not so much. <laughs> Daniel, even even you don't go to the club to get drunk. You do get a little <laughs> bit lubricated, but your goal with the the, the like alcohol. Your goal with the alcohol is to overcome social anxieties and to be more yeah. comfortable in that space, not to get drunk. So even yeah. even you, though you do participate in the alcoholic consumption of club mm -hmm. life, right? a lot of people do go to the clubs explicitly to get just totally blasted. and mm -hmm. or, or high. Yeah. Or high or whatever. Yeah. To yeah. Get like, totally twisted as far as their, their, their yeah. like, there's, there's perception one, of the world. There's one cultural geographer who puts it well. She talks about um, clubs as being like heterosexual marketplaces um, mm, for youth. Yeah, mm -hmm. And I've been to yeah. some clubs in Miami, and that was so not my thing. But yeah, yeah, that and was... that, that's never been. I don't think that's ever been the uh, goal of goth clubs. Yeah. And I mean, Trey, on a previous episode, you you said you you would guess the median age of Chicago clubs to be around thirty or late twenties, and so it's it's always been a and again, I have to rely on other people's accounts of 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 non goth clubs because I don't attend them. Don't bother. But a a non norm okay yeah. <laughs> non normative. You know, not a it's not a meat market. It's not a you can't be over twenty five kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, that's that's the the few uh, you know straight non goth clubs I've been in. It's a very yeah, it's a very hypersexualized, uncomfortable mm. atmosphere. A very at least for a woman. You yeah. know, it's a mm -hmm. little an undercurrent of danger. You know, not danger, yeah. but you know, it's somebody like me. It's just not my thing. But yeah. you know, I, I've been to the castle in Tampa. I've been to Dracula's Ball in Philly, and those, those were you know people. They're people there to have an experience. You know. Yeah, those those do seem more sexually oriented, or. Uh... Again, I don't want to use the word performative because it's not the way I intend it to mean. But ex yeah, I guess experience oriented. Those two specifically, I would think that there there would be a more of a mix of goths and something like we would see, like I would say specifically with Whippy Gothic Weekend, where there's tourists kind of dressing up for the experience rather than a goth specific place. Those two, I think, are more like that, and that's part of why they've like a place like the castle has stayed in business for so long mm -hmm. because you you kind of have to to some degree if you want to stay solvent, I guess. Yeah, Let's like say the... any of those places that have more of a sort of a national, you know, presence where people know about it from outside mm -hmm. the area. Because a lot of the, yeah. the places, 
you know, a lot of goth clubs in various towns are underground. They're not, I mean, they, they don't hide their advertisement. They're not putting out secret passwords. Well, maybe Cloak and Dagger. But yeah. other than that sort of thing and those sort and of fuck secret... fuck Cloak and Dagger. I'm just going to throw that in. Those underground clubs are one thing. But in general, a lot of the things, even big things like Nocturna or Medusas, which have been going on for ages, mm -hmm. um, aren't necessarily nationally known by a lot of people yeah. so that it wouldn't be yeah. a tourist destination whereas something like Whitby or like the castle it has some notoriety yeah. outside of the local scene and so people who want to experience oh I'm going to Tampa I want to experience this quirky aspect of Tampa and they go to that as a tourist and they they, they put on the mask for I'm going to a goth club and I want to look the part and kind of blend in and have that whole experience. Um, but that's always going to be more of a thing with the, I guess, bigger, more nationally recognized places with a reputation for being a huge place for, for goth individuals to congregate. Like Trey, do you, do you f uh, find that, um, from what you've seen, have goth clubs become more exclusive, do you think, like the local places you've been to? I wouldn't say so, no. Um, I, I would say there are certainly some goth clubs that do have that exclusivity. Um, I don't experience those because I have little to no patience for them, though I do Agreed. I do want to check out Cloak & Dagger once, and I know somebody who's sure. who's in it and said she would take me as her plus one at some point, but I, I'm not on any sort of mailing list, so I don't know when they are. So it's simply a matter of them reaching out to me and saying, hey, it's going to be this whenever it's going to be and go in. But that would be the most, I guess, selective kind of club with a mandated dress code and stuff like and, that. And that's they're also, everyone who's been there talks about how it's, it's like the LA scene. So it right. seems to be something mm -hmm. more indicative to some of those bigger environments that do have a reputation of being exclusive, which, you know, LA in general, not just the goth scene in yeah. LA, but LA in general is perceived around the nation as being a lot of, you know, the velvet rope clubs and you have to have a certain amount of money or look a certain way or have breasts to be allowed in. Um, and that's sort of the, the, the existence there. But most of the clubs that I've been to, especially ones that I enjoy here in Colorado, a um, little bit in California, a little bit in southern illinois um have always been very open and there'll be random people coming in and in general they're not necessarily shooed away they are certainly not welcomed per se mm -hmm. at least when they're you know not looking the part to some degree where it's yeah. there is a degree of you're a stranger and you don't look quite like you belong and there's a reticence to interact but that's different from being exclusionary where you basically will have bouncers kicking them out or somebody not letting them in in the first place. Mm -hmm. But that's more what I've seen about any of the clubs that I've generally been to being, I guess, picky about clientele is, is simply that those people who don't really appear to fit are viewed and interacted with in a wary manner, mm -hmm. not necessarily directly exclusionary, however. Because here, the, the two different clubs with goth nights that I studied, they're either free or extremely low cost, you know, the door fee being like $3 before 11. Um, and I looked at two clubs. One of them, the Depot, is a smaller club, which I think has become kind of the center of adult life there. And then there's a large uh, LGBT club, Grand Central, that has Electroshock, which is basically a kind of goth EBM dance night. And the other places you know more old school goth and i've noticed at the the gay club they'll have some like normies who just come in on like bachelorette party or something and people are just like what because they're not there to be part of anything mm -hmm. they're just there to kind of do their thing and leave but um I mean, part of that could be yeah. more that the, the venue is a gay club because it's not yeah. that uncommon for bachelorette parties to want to go out to uh, gay clubs for kind of the reasons you were expressing when you were talking about your discomfort around standard clubs and the sort of meat market atmosphere. But, you know, given that a, a gay club is at least predominantly perceived as being men interested in men, uh, lesbians are 
kind of there's a little bit of lesbian erasure within that community. Um, but a bachelorette party could feel like they could go there, have a really good time, drink, but also be safe because the men there aren't on the prowl for them. Mm -hmm. So and there no is a lot there, of that. And no one there seems to be on the prowl for anyone. Um, just seem to be having, just having a good time. And, mm -hmm. and I know I talked about nightclubs some in the, in the thesis. Um, and God yeah, I, no, I was going to ask you, yeah, I was going to ask you sticking on this theme because I, you, you wrote about in the thesis and elsewhere, the kind of uh dance specifically as a, a kind of deviance in those spaces and i basic i think i completely agree with you i would love to hear you kind of talk a bit about your perception of how that's a queering or deviation of s standard you know club behavior so i i noticed that you know in the clubs you know people weren't dancing a lot which led me to think about the community aspect, you know, why are people going? But when people are dancing, this is not the heterosexual marketplace, you know. Mm. This is very much people, you know, there have been like joke videos on YouTube about, you know, different goth dancing moves. But yeah. um and in books too. Oh wow. Yeah. So what what they they have in common is that it's very individualized. It's a very personal experience. Um, did you notice any particular noteworthy difference between that um, that dance floor paradigm between Electroshock and the Depot, um, either with the just the population on the dance floor, or more importantly, the the prevalence of dancing on your own as a personal expression versus dancing in a group or with one other person or is, is one, are they both about the same or was one more close to what your idea of a standard club would be? I would say that Electroshock, um, which is at the LGBT club, that attracted a wider audience to begin with. So there was definitely more of a show of spectacular styles. There was the usual, you know, gay crowd just coming to party. Um, and I would say that dance-wise, there would be a little bit more of, you know, a sexualized dancing, but it was confined to maybe a couple dancing together if that happened. And it was still fairly rare. Okay. So there was no, like, you know, bumping and grinding or typical, mm -hmm. typical club moves. Yeah. Part, so of the, part of the reason I ask is I've been kind of seeing a shift in that paradigm just between going to clubs, between when I was initially going in the mid to late 90s and today, whereas when I was first going out, the idea that really seeing anybody dance with anybody else, with the rare exceptions of when someone played something that was like a waltz or a tango or some sort of a partnered dance, some people would have fun and sort of partner up and, and do the traditional dance. But in general, when I was first going out, there would be essentially nobody dancing with one another. Everyone would be dancing in their own little world, maybe mm -hmm. acknowledging other people and acknowledging their dance style and interacting in a way to avoid bumping into them, mm -hmm. but no real dancing together. Whereas now, and in the last probably 10 years or so since I've been going out, maybe closer to five, but five to 10 years, you know, going out to the clubs in Chicago, it's uncommon for me to not see anybody dancing together. Usually it's not the majority, but there are on almost any given song with a significant dance floor presence, at least one or two people dancing together. And I've been pulled into dancing with people on occasion too. And it's been a bit of a shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, since I wrote the thesis, I'm seeing a younger crowd coming out to the depot. Um, and one of the mm. DJs is younger, so I'm wondering if he's, you know, helping to pull in a younger crowd. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I am seeing more people dancing, dancing together. Okay. Yeah. So I was, I was thinking about um, kind of spatial norms on the dance floor. Mm. So goth is, you know, departing from the heterosexualized marketplace. Mm. And I started thinking about, you know, a queer theory that I'm coming across in my coursework. So I was kind of thinking, is this a way of, you know, first kind of like gothing? Is it um, disordering the club by bringing different relationships in, in there? Mm -hmm. 
So I started thinking about that in a couple ways. First being like these individualized movements and moves. And I tied that in kind of an experimental paper. And, and that was the one, Trey, that you heard me um, read at Northwestern. It was right. kind of a truncated version of it, mm -hmm. but about Gothic spatial norms reflecting distance and stillness. You know, I was uh, quoted from, mm -hmm. you know, Joy Division, touching from a distance. Mm -hmm. yeah. Th so, and this was, that was kind of like, not quite like Andy Harriman's Goth 101. I've, I've heard her talk kind of an introduction to what goth might be. So I think there are a couple of different things there. First, that's one way of um, you know, disordering the club, making goth an experience, a haven from the outside world. And thinking of that specific club, it's uh, two of the walls are mirrors. So I also thought about... Um, just getting into some spatial theory and things like that. But yeah, please. Um, one of my informants, Linda, she was talking, I asked her questions about dancing. And she said that, you know, she dances, she didn't say with people. She said she dances around people. Mm. So there's something about being proximal, being, mm. you know, close, but not too close for comfort. And, you know, in this space surrounded by reflections so um, as someone who does not necessarily think about the human, you know, I'm not a humanities oriented person. So I started thinking about, you know, how does this reflect Gothic norms and rituals? And um, in the thesis, which I wrote before I thought about that so much in depth, I talked about what queering a club might look like. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't thinking at that point about what necessarily gothic norms queering the club might look like i was thinking kind of about age mm. i was thinking about people's relationships with objects like you know um there's a theorist called sarah ahmed and she talks about queer phenomenology and she's talking about like dis disturbing the order of things so i was thinking about um like the order of things in this club, you know, rather than being goths being oriented towards other dancing bodies, as they might have been in a straight club, they're either oriented inwards towards themselves and the experience that they're having, or, you know, they might be oriented towards comfortable chairs or bar stools so they can sit and talk with their friends. So that's kind of where I was thinking about at different points in time as, as I've been writing thinking about how like the body and spatial elements can intertwine. So goth can, for some at least, you know, can also be a spatial practice where like where rituals and movement are transforming the club. Um, there's a theorist called Edward Casey and he talks about from space to place. So a space is something I would, he would probably say in the absence of people, but a place is something that's created through the interaction between bodies and landscape. Mm. So the club becomes, rather than a space, it becomes a sacred place. Mm -hmm. um, so that was yeah, those were some of, mediated by like ritual yes. and communal experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that's no, kind of that. that's kind of what I was thinking. So you know, like a kind of choreographic dialogue that's expressing mm. different things. Have you guys noticed? Like, um, do you think goth dancing is kind of a constant across? across clubs that you've been to or, or things that you've experienced? I would, yeah. yeah, I would say there's definitely yeah, elements me, yeah. that, that seem to carry from place to place. Now, I've only been to clubs in the U.S., so I can't speak to um, going overseas and any divergence there, but... Well, I'm sure you've seen videos, though. I've seen some videos, right, and, and although most of them are historical artifacts rather than, oh, this uh, was yeah, happening, sure. you know, just last week at... You know, right. the bat cave or, or wherever it happens to be mm. um so i don't know how much of that is you know archival from the 80s is one thing but i'm more interested in how things are right now but going from club to club that i've been to at least which not a huge sampling but wide enough to be more than just a small tiny little market um there's a lot of cohesion with with how people utilize the dance floor space mm -hmm. um the types of moves they do, the types of interaction there is, the quantity of dancing they do, you know, whether they're on the floor all the time or whether they're spending more time chatting and, you know, drinking or whatnot versus moving on the floor. 
um, there does seem to be a lot of similarities to pretty much every club I've been to where the dance floor seems to have the same sort of position and the interaction of the people with that space seems to be fairly consistent across the board. So one thing at the depot that struck me as interesting was that the DJs will sometimes the, um, the DJ booth is like one step up from the floor. It's placed in a corner. So I've seen the DJs leave the booth and dance and then go back to, to, to change songs. Sarah does that in uh, Nocturna as well every once in a while, though it does help that she has a couple other people there who can kind of fill in so she doesn't have to run back before the song ends. She can usually have someone else queuing up the next song. But um, Well, it's also, it's also harder because she's on an actual stage like a band would perform on. So she, you have to run down the stairs and it's more of a she, – she's more of a focus the way that that room is set up than I would think other places would be. Uh, you'd be surprised. Um, a lot of DJ booths well, I mean, tend to in, be like that. Outside of Chicago. Yeah, because I know Neo, you had the DJ up behind in in a, in a booth, and um, Bittersweet is the same way. And, Medusa's also. Uh, yeah. Although the, it was interesting going to uh, La Petite Mort because it's basically in like a a living room, kind of. It's basically a small dive bar, so the DJ is yeah. behind the bar, essentially, but people are sitting at the bar and can you know, chat with the DJ just fine there, and then they've got the tables and chairs around the edge and a, and a little dance floor. Yeah, even there, because that dance floor is absolutely tiny. It's, it's I don't know, what, 10 by 10, maybe? Still bigger than Debonair's, but yes, it's very small. Oh, is it really? Yeah, but even there, even even on that, that space, uh, I didn't see anybody dancing together, at least the one night that I went to that. No, that night is um, definitely more, and, and it fits with the theme of the night, but it's a, a much more traditional night that feels closer to the goth nights that I was going to when I first started going, in that mm -hmm. the, the use of the space is much more normative to the goth standard of people dancing on their own there was a little bit of circling up here and there but not much of that and i definitely didn't see anybody dancing in partners or or yeah. groups where they were touching and interacting in any other way other than dancing as leah said around one another and i, I wonder too thinking like both both clubs that i've been to well, i've been to three um, but the both clubs I focused on in Baltimore are, you know, they're dedicated clubs, you know, and bars. They, um, and, you know, they, they both have a distinct identity. And um, mm -hmm. I've also been to a couple nights in D.C. back when I was starting the research. And one of the nights there, they've held it in um, just a local bar that they seem to just run out. Um, and it was just it was different. You know, like there was a guy in a Seahawks jersey who was looking really confused and all the goths around him. <laughs> so it's interesting to think, too, that, you know, how spaces are transformed by the presence of people. Yeah, and I kind of want to get into that at, to close out here because you do talk about that in your paper, the interaction between... I mean, you reference a specific performance. There's the band performer, the audience member, and then the objects in the environment. Um but you talk about them kind of all melding into one and this, uh, you, you bring up this idea of embodiment mm -hmm. and I, well, I mean, first of all, this is, it's, it was great to read that because I, it's not something that I have seen in previous sociological literature on subculture. Um, and I guess where I'm coming from is at least currently in my current thought process. And obviously that can change from, you know, how in the future, but it's this sort of, it it does come back to ontology for me and the, the, the inactivist approach is more this bringing forth through a reciprocal interaction between mind, body, and environment. So the idea is that our worlds are brought forth and enacted in part through the material of the world and that those those aren't, they're not metaphysically distinct, I guess. So there's no observer observed dichotomy but that the creation of a goth space, for example, is active and dynamic and that the materiality of the space exists not because we stand apart from it, but because we are a part of it and we are interacting with it and, and vice versa. And, that, and, and that's all part of the ontological becoming. 
it probably takes it farther into an activism than what you're saying but from your perspective how do you how do you see that interaction of the material world and um the organism in this case the the goths that are in the space and that interaction is it similar to that kind of i don't remember if this if this was when we were recording or not but talking about the sort of fantasy of uh of romanticized history that kind of thing is becomes reality because we embody it through that interaction when in a club space that's actually something that I've been doing more thinking about because this thesis is going to be one part of a dissertation, but I'm thinking more and more about spaces, places, and people. Mm -hmm. You know what's what's happening in those in those spaces, and um, it's hard to say because once again, this is very site specific, um, mm -hmm. and some of the things I talk about. I talk about materiality and that's that's a very new topic for me that's something that that you know material culture is something I never encountered before I went to grad school mm -hmm. I never thought about yeah thought about you know ways to study an object and when I was writing about that in the thesis it was just experimental I just I, I wanted to see what would happen if I what would come out if I started thinking about what I saw you know how what mm -hmm. could I use to explain what I was seeing that was different. And I talk about when band read this ever who use a lot of props to connect with the audience. Yeah. And that's something I'd never seen with any other band. And I just thought that was that, you know, there, and there are props that, you know, some of them return show after show after show. Like there are signs that, you know, band members hand out to hold up, you know, people, they want to hold up the signs and wave them. And so th there's this element of human connection through these objects that I had never, mm -hmm. I'd never thought about before. You know, it's like when we go to a show or a concert, you know, is, does the singer usually walk around the entire floor? Right, right. Well, I, ironically, as as much as it's not a band you particularly care for, Daniel, uh, Rogue of the Don't say Crux Shadows. The Rogue does that a lot. God he likes it. to he likes to wander around the floor, and it's really very interesting experience to be at one of their concerts when that's happening. Um, so just thought I'd mention that aspect. Yeah, you lost me. You lost me. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I, no, I agree. I, I like and. What what are your thoughts? Like, where are you thinking? Because I, again, I, this is uh, for me too as well. This, this is sort of at least an activism and the sort of um, the the notion that there's this reciprocal interaction between um, object and person or really organism because an activism is less uh, anthropocentric or human focused than other because it's it's more about breaking down dichotomies than um creating dichotomies like determinism or free will and that kind of thing so the, the this notion that our reality that there is there isn't necessarily there isn't really a pre-given world that we are enacting and embodying through material practice and and through interaction you know reciprocally that that is what is constituting our reality and and interest it's interesting to me to kind of port that over to goth experiences because they do we do kind of uh deviate the club space when we're going to a established place we'll have you know usually the dj and the promoter will decorate it and mm -hmm. we interact with those and they have specific given meanings and we are uh living out through through our specific rituals and creating that kind of sacred space and that lived um anachronistic like romanticized uh yeah yeah if that makes sense yeah yeah it's it's something that that, that i think about too it's like you know it, i'm not gonna say attention but you know there's there's you know you can think of it as a ritual you know going to the club decorating the club making this space your own and then you think about like we were talking before the before the show a bit about um you know kind of like goth in everyday life you know how, how do you put mm. these two these two things together maybe they're just two kind of kind of separate things you know, the historical element of goth dress is just not something i see a whole lot of around here mm. so it's hard for me essentially being an ethnographer 
yeah. to make um, for Baltimore an argument about that. I, I think there's there are arguments to be made on a different on a different level. If if that makes sense, you know, like you can think of if people um, say like they're really into you know trad goth neo Victorian. I'm not going to say the S word, steampunk, but <laughs> <laughs> no, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if if they're into those, those particular elements are the most meaningful to them, and they're bringing right. this into into a club. You know, they're bringing these relics aren't the right word, but they're reanimating the past and the baggage mm -hmm. that comes with the past, yeah, and they're exactly. bringing this into a club. Be making that, you know, transforming that into a sacred sphere. Mm -hmm. That might not necessarily be what I be what I happen to see, but I think there, you know, there there are questions and interesting things there about what it means to 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 subvert is not the word I'm looking for. No, like you know, there there are buzzwords. There's so yeah, there's so many, yeah so yeah subvert is one of them, but that's not you know yeah. to to trans. I prefer you know transform transform to transform yeah. something. I've also um you probably don't know this about me, but I also did a uh, practicum at the Smithsonian Center for Folk Life. Mm -hmm. So um, I have a certificate in museum studies, mm. my graduate certificate. So I went in and. Um, uh, the Smithsonian has a folk life festival every year for 10 days on the mall. And I was curious about things like, you know, performance and, and ethnography. So there's a lot of literature on festivals of all kinds, but particularly mm. like ethnic festivals and things being liminal spaces. So being yeah. a space like the folk life festival where different cultures come in and interact during this time when things are possible. Mm -hmm. And right, right, right. Um, so I did a research project for a couple months there and helped, you know, work on the Sounds of California program, thinking about, um, like, there's something called performance ethnography, and this is another topic, but I think you can port that over. I mean, I think you, you can think about, I don't want to say the goth experience, that sounds like some kind of theme park ride, but, <laughs> but you know, I, I think you can think about you know, the, the club and God is, is being this liminal temporary space of possibility. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I just think of, you know, the image of the nightclub after everybody's gone home, you know, the people cleaning up or, you know, the mm -hmm. people standing outside and smoking cloves, you know, the feeling of what's left there. Mm -hmm. That That's kind of something I, I want to think about more in my dissertation. I, and I, I mean, I think that's, part of it as well i think part of it part of the goth experience is the uncanny the making the making strange that that un, odd discomforting um feeling that you get that you would get at the end of a club night when that kind of thing is happening the otherness mm -hmm. of it um, the otherness of you know becoming part of the nocturnal world of people Mm. Yeah, driving home when the sun is coming up, yeah. kind of thing. I but I and going back to your, you know, the aesthetic not being a focus for those specific clubs. I would still think that there are those sartorial idioms still are present. I I think you talk about the DJ, the shirts that she wears. One uh, said like deviant freak or caustic. And caustic. And, yeah, yeah. She yeah. she gave her deviant shirt to Mark Burgess of the Chameleons when they played here. <laughs> so she had to go next door to awesome. to the uh, cafe, you know, or the uh, diner and buy another shirt for herself. But um, yeah, I mean, they're definitely stylistic hallmarks. I just don't think that they're you know gate they're not like self-policing boundaries mm. yeah they're not they're you not know, right. gatekeeping elements they're simply yeah. ways people choose to express themselves and happen to have a cohesive theme yeah it's like if if you if you walk into you know a goth night you're gonna know it's a goth night right right, right. um yeah but you know here i've seen i've seen all kinds of people come into bats over baltimore at the depot who definitely don't don't look goth but they don't also look like they're there to crash the party Mm. Um, you mm. know, I've seen like a guy come in with like a pimp hat and a cane and, and 
which is kind of interesting. And two, I've noticed at the depot more recently, they, they put up a sign that said Baltimore's home for subculture. Hmm. I thought it was cool that, you know, people there, and depot has other nights. It's not like a dedicated goth club. I think, you know, these days clubs have to do what they have to do to stay open. Yeah. Um, I don't think yeah. exclusivity, unless maybe you're, I don't know, in New York or L.A., really works for a lot of businesses. I think it's pretty and extremely that, rare to have a, a, a dedicated yeah. goth club. Yeah, I think, That kind yeah. of frustrates some of the ethnographic... Well, I guess... I, I don't know. I guess news articles don't count as ethnographic work, but uh, the, the because there, sometimes in some of the stuff I read, there's an assumption that because someone is at a goth night, they therefore must be goth and that you can extrapolate their interpretation of what goth is to culture which isn't i don't think that's been the case for maybe necessarily ever i mean there obviously have been cases of goth specific clubs but um it's always been enough of a uh, niche that we have to share spaces with other events the discussion revolving around space and bodies in space and that embodied mm -hmm. act um, made me think of something that I don't think has ever been done that I'm aware of, at least within the standard goth club environment, but it has been something that's been up and coming probably in the last three or four years that is interesting and might be an interesting thing to look into from the perspective of uh, dance spaces and that interaction and how they're used. But have either of you ever heard of silent parties? No. Yeah. Okay, so the, the concept for, for Leah's benefit then is a silent party is basically, it's usually an EDM event. They're the most common ones, but it's some DJ event. Usually there are multiple DJs and everybody who attends is wearing wireless headphones and they can usually on those headphones adjust volume and switch between any one of the different DJs. So they are in this dance space dancing to the music in their head, essentially. If you take off the headphones... All you hear is a room full of people dancing, maybe some random people singing along. So it's it's like inhabiting a space where suddenly it's been okay to publicly sing the songs in your head. Um, and mm. it's, it's a very interesting environment. Usually the headphones also have some sort of indicator on them to indicate what channel you're listening to, which gives it a little bit of a social aspect in that you can kind of look around to see, oh, those people are looking interesting what are they listening to and you can switch to their channel and kind of move virtually into their space so it's a very interesting concept and i can certainly see it being used at a goth night i wouldn't mind seeing a goth night that had <laughs> hey the industrial channel and the goth channel and uh, the new wave like channel the best, the best serious xm ever <laughs> so i mean that would be an interesting counterpoint to the the more prevalent uh multi-floor kind of events where you've got the different floors yeah. having different events but you could still be in the same space maybe hanging out with your friends even if your friends don't necessarily have the exact same taste in music from a dancing perspective um but i just think that's a real interesting commentary and might be something to inform your your discussion about uh, embodied spaces as a, yeah. another counterpoint was it mostly younger people um Who i've never like i said i've never been to them okay. but it does seem to have a younger crowd there are a couple articles online um i think one of them is from someone who was not in that younger demographic who went to one and kind of was giving their opinions feelings towards it and I don't know how prevalent they are across the country. I know there are a couple organizations, but they're actually fairly noteworthy in Chicago. Um, and I, I keep intending to go to one just because it seems like such a fascinatingly surreal experience. But I've never gotten myself to go I out. I hope they disinfect those headphones. <laughs> nah, I'm not too worried about it. Yeah, because I, I was They're over-ear yeah. headphones, not in-ear. So it's okay. less, not non-concerning, but less of a concern. Still, that's how you get pink eye when you put on the VR uh. headsets at uh, <laughs> conventions because everybody's touching their butts. Sorry. Yeah, the, <laughs> yeah, the, the reason I ask about the younger people is because I've come into more contact with college-age kids. First, you know, being a DJ and second with my assistantship at the university and uh, it just touches upon a generational thing that people are interacting differently than, mm -hmm. you know, we're probably all close to the same age than, you know, when we were in high school or, you know, mm -hmm. college age, that it's just yeah. this. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering if, if there's a, 
you know, generational shift towards this kind of mm. inward personalized. I, I don't know. It's just it just made me think. Yeah, well, certainly the the article I kind of quickly pulled up here um, does indicate it tends to skew younger, though it did make an interesting point that kind of touches on something that you were talking about earlier regarding the meat market aspect. This is a great way to even more strongly give that sort of individualized anti-meat market environment. While it can still happen, it's harder for you know, random guy to come up and start yelling in your ear, trying his latest pickup lines because you got headphones on. The best he could do is, you know, switch to your same channel and, and try to dance in your sight line to impress you, you with his uh, plumage. <laughs> <laughs> there is a, there is a scene. There's this movie that's been in, production for like five years now called my summer as a goth it was a kickstarter it was kickstarted twice and i have no idea where it is as far as production goes now but they they did release a clip from it where they do have a scene of that exact thing in a cemetery as a goth event um but i have also never seen that uh publicized anywhere online as a kind of goth thing and i don't know if that would necessarily uh, work as a goth knight because again there's the focus on the communal aspect uh, and the coming together that's why it's so tricky to kind of you know pick apart because it's mm. it's companionship you're going to the clubs for companionship to socialize mm. with your friends to see your friends but when you do dance it's everyone who I spoke to talked about it just being very individual so there's kind of this this tension there, Which, but and that but and that's what makes it communal yeah. because it's an agreed um, expectation, uh, and the the fact that you are interacting the 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 uh, embodying that ideal through individual dance with the knowledge that everyone is doing the same thing makes it individualized but highly. Uh, you know, individualized and ritualistic, but also communal at the same yeah, time. Yeah, because there's definitely, there's literature, plenty of literature on clubbing out there. Mm. Um, and a lot of that was written quite a while ago. But yeah. clubbing and dancing, there's a totally different body of literature. But, um, you know, there's plenty of stuff, especially about, you know, rave scenes being like this. Yeah. D dancing is communal ecstasy. Mm -hmm. And that's just not. You know, when when I talk to people about why they dance the goth nights and, you know, what they feel, that's just not, you know, yeah, it's, it's just something different. It's definitely different. And as far as the electronic rave scene type of thing, the idea there is that it is in the dance that the socialization happens, that the communal nature of it happens in that you're acting as a whole group. Part of that ritualized experience is all moving together. Whereas in, in more of a goth club, especially back when I was first going, most of the interaction and just per, sort of like you were describing at the depot, most of the interaction, most of the socializing that people did were at the bar area or back in the beer garden was in earshot of the music so you could hear what was going on. But the communication was happening off of the dance floor with the underlying understanding that when that one song comes on, it's okay that the person you're in yeah. this deep conversation with will just dart off. Just no warning. They're just, oh, yeah. gotta get answer to the song. I'm, this is my song. And they jump I'm, off, they dance. I'm guilty of that myself. <laughs> and um, and that's also one big difference between Bats Over Baltimore, the, the night at the depot that I have gone to, and um, Electro Shock at Grand Central, that Bats Over Baltimore markets itself as old school goth. Um, mm. And it's not like you know it has bats in the title yeah, so it, has it must bats be old school goth <laughs> so yeah it's just it's old school goth and industrial so people who go go to that i think that also raises the possibility of the nostalgia factor um like people who want to hear songs and i'm not going to say songs from their youth but songs that might have had a memory or something tied to them versus um electroshock which other than their retro shock nights where they play you know 80s it's generally more just dance oriented music. Yeah, I probably wouldn't so, say songs of their youth, but songs of their formative goth experience mm -hmm. would be probably yeah. a, a more clear way of, of of 
portraying that relationship? I think that has that probably has to do with the community aspect too. Something that people have shared that's in their memory. Good. I think ending on that kind of ambiguity and that tension is a good place to stop because it is, I, I've always said that I think one of the things I love most about goth culture is the dialectical nature of it, that we are uh, in conversation with each other. And it's through that discourse that the uh, that goth culture is reified and, and made uh, relevant to um, the participants. And so that's not always easily uh, boiled down to um, a theory or a, you know, a few words. And so I think that's, that's a good, as good a place as any to uh, wrap it up. So Leah, thanks again so much for coming on. Let us know where we can find skydivers and uh, any of your personal work that you want to direct us to uh, your radio show and that kind of thing. Oh, sure. Um, if you want to find skydivers, that's either skydiversmusic.net. Don't go to skydiversmusic.com because that was like taken over by some strange Japanese bunnies. Like, seriously, <laughs> when you go to the page, now it's like some spam about skateboarding, but yeah. Okay. Or you can just, you can uh, go on Spotify or CD Baby, look mm. up Skydivers, Hello Atmosphere is the name of the album. And my radio show is called Delightfully Depressing on WMUC-FM. We're off of the air for the summer because there's a lot of maintenance. But yeah. I've been on Wednesdays at noon. And if you go to mixcloud.com slash Leah Bush, that's my name, that'll take you to podcasts. So, you know, if you want some music to, you know, goth out to. I have a couple weeks yeah. that are just like, you know, back to school, you know, 80s goth party. So it's a mix of different things, but, you know, there's definitely kind of a, you know, dark wave bent to a lot of it. You know, when mm -hmm. you've got like mm -hmm. 53 weeks of music, <laughs> you got to come up with a lot. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of uh, dark wave bands now and it makes up, I think, the bulk of the newer kind of goth bands right. really. But um, yeah, and I will have links to all those in the show notes if you want to swipe left or right on your podcast app or if you're on their website, that will all be there uh, easy to reach. So Leah and Trey, thank you both uh, so much for coming on. It was a pleasure to hang out. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Let me know if you're in Baltimore and I'll tell you where to go. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thanks again, Leah, for hanging out. It really was a pleasure to spend some time with you. Uh, come back next month. We're going to be doing another show. We've got all kinds of great stuff coming up for the end of the year. Of course, the Gothquisition to cap the end of the year off. But we've got an episode coming up about um, sexism in industrial uh, with an expert panel of four guests, including Andy Harriman and Alex Reed. We've got an episode on politics with another uh, panel of experts. Uh, I recently was interviewed for a article that may be out already forthcoming on the issue of the alt-right in goth culture and uh, politics in general. So that should be interesting. We've got more interviews with musicians coming up. A lot of you enjoyed the Tara interview. So there's more of that kind of thing happening. And we've got some special treats for Patreon members at the end of the year. We're doing a live uh, Google Hangout with Mark and myself. Uh, so if you're on the Patreon page, you will get to spend some time with us. So as always, if you appreciate the show, you want to help us stay on the air, please head over to patreon.com slash cemetery confessions. And uh, for as little as $1 a month, you can support the show. Thanks again for spending some time with us this month. And until next time, stay dark. The preceding program is a member of The Belfry, a network of blogs, podcasts, and videos for the darkly inclined. Go to thebelfry.rip for more information.